بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار as it has been announced and spread we're going to do inshallah azwajal some introductory lessons concerning as salafia and what is as salafia and the reason for that are many from them is that we live in in a time right now where people's understanding of Al-Islam is varied all over the place. And we found that when something small happens, like the recent um, the recent paper that was sent out by one of the former graduates of the University of Al Medina, in which he described some realities that are taking place with some Salafi people, some realities that are negative, and he attributed a Salafia to being a man made methodology. We were surprised and shocked to see that there were many people who claimed to Salafia supported and acknowledging that what was written was acceptable and it was correct. When, in fact, anyone who has a basic concept and a <coughs> basic cursory exposure to a serifia, he would have been able to make the distinction between the behavior of some people with serifi and between the claim of an individual who says that a serifia is a man-made minhaj like the other manahij of the different groups in Al-Islam, from the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, man-made, Jamaat al-Tabligh, man-made, the Muhajirun, Hizb al-Tahrir, man-made, the other many groups that are out there, modern ones as well as the ones that are historically recorded, all named after people who came and they put those issues together. As for a Salafia, then it is the pure Islam that the Prophet came with, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. And the description or the name of a Salafia is not something that's new. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure, and Allah knows best, that the writer of that paper, he knew the distinction between what he was saying and what the scholars of the past said concerning a Salafia because the proofs of it are just too many. But it just goes to show that this is not the first time that something like this has happened. For your information, there were those people who used to write these types of statements and make these far-fetched claims. There was a man who was from Syria. He was killed, unfortunately. In this fitna that's going on in Syria right now. He was the big mufti of Syria. His name is Muhammad Ramadan Saeed Bouti. He was blown up and his death is on the internet. He was an individual who was really opposed to a Salafia because he was really mutshaddid on his Hanafi way. There were a lot of people who were like that. So I'm not here to talk bad about that particular man. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was collected by Imam Bukhari he told us La tasubu al-amwat faqad afdaw ila ma qaddumu Don't curse the people who are dead. Don't speak bad about the people who are dead. They have 
gone forward to their judgment, what they're going to get. So that's enough that the person is going to go forward and Allah is going to give the hisab to everybody with precision and with justice. I'm just making a point. He wrote a book and he called his book as Salafiya Marhala Zamaniya Mubaraka La Madhab Islami. He claimed that as Salafiya is a blessed time. It was a blessed time with Baraka, but it is not a Madhab in Al Islam. And he tried his best to show how Salafi is something that's new. And he failed miserably. And that's because of the many proofs that stare a person right in the face concerning this issue. There are those people, as I mentioned, some of the personalities of the past. Maybe you've heard of them, maybe you haven't. One of them is a man by the name of Jamaluddin al-Afghani. Jamaluddin al-Afghani. And another man was with him, Muhammad Abdu. They were together. And they wrote some good things trying to bring the people back to the Sunnah. They had a harakah of Islah. They were trying to rectify the Ummah. And they wrote some good things trying to get the people to comprehend the importance of the Sunnah and the role of the Sunnah. Some people said that Salafi has started with these two. And that's not the case. One of them was connected to Masons. Both of them although they said some good things about trying to revive the sunnah, although they did that, they used to put the intellect before the naql. And that in and of itself goes against a salafiyah. So they had some good, but to say that they started the salafiyah is ignorance and is something that's not acceptable because, as you're going to see, historically it's not sound, it's not correct. Some people who I know all of you have heard of Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala. Some people claim that they are the two people who started the Salafiyya and that again is something that's not true because they themselves negated that and they rejected that as you're going to see inshallah. So the point is that this new paper that was written by the graduate who was now living in America that paper should never had caused people to be uh, unbalanced. We take the good and the truth of what any and everyone says, but we can't embrace falsehood. And this goes to show, Ikhwani, one of the big problems that we have today. It is not enough for you, Ya Abdullah, it's not enough for me as Muslims, students of knowledge. It's not enough for you to just try to memorize some ayat here and some hadith there and some fiqh issues here and there. But we have to make a serious effort and a serious jihad to get what's known as a ta'seel al-ilmi. A ta'seel al-ilmi. That's where a person develops for himself a methodology of educating himself and comprehending issues that when the winds of adversity blow, he's not swayed and he's not pushed off of the square. He's not swayed, he's not pushed off of the square. He knows how to look at and he knows how to comprehend every issue that comes his way. Even the issues that are big that he finds them difficult to understand himself, because he has the ta'seel al-ilmi, he knows still how to deal with the situation, where to go to get guidance, what to do to be protected. So we don't have this issue going on right now and as a result of that, when people come and they say we don't need any of the ulama who come from the Arab world, for an example, because we have our own ulama, there's some truth to that statement and there's some falsehood to that statement. The one who has the ta'seel al-ilmi, he doesn't get upset just like that because someone made that statement. Because it is possible that a scholar from Arabia, for an example, he doesn't understand something that's going on in Tottenham, London. It's possible. So why are you getting upset and going crazy? It's possible. But what does the person mean by that? If the person says that and he's trying to bring the scholars down, then that's what we reject. That's what we reject. We take the truthfulness of the statement, we reject the falsehood of the statement. So the ulama of al-Islam, they have usul, and they have a ta'seel al-ilmi, they have usul. Those usul that they have, those fundamentals that they understand, this religion, aqidah, fiqh, and other than that, 
those usul will be applicable for every place and every time. Every place and every time. But they may not know the detail of a particular situation that's going on. And as a result of that, lack of knowledge of that detail, they may not be qualified to understand that detail. That's possible. That happens. That happens. No doubt about that. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam to sleep in kathira. He knew everything that was there to be known about this religion and those companions used to ask him. But certain things happened during his time, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when they were making the pollination between the trees and they used to do it a particular way. They asked him for his opinion. He told them do it the other way. When they did it the other way, their crops didn't grow. And as a result of that, they came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, you told us to change and when we change, look what happened. He said, look, you people know your dunya better than me. This thing about pollination, you asked me in my opinion, I told you. When it comes to the deen, I, I tell you about the deen, but don't blame me for what happened in that particular issue. So the point is, the point is, if someone were to come and he were to make a claim that this dawah and mubarak, a sedif here, is something that's man-made, the person who has the basic knowledge of a sedif here, he'll comprehend that. I think we are putting too much emphasis on titles, too much emphasis on the outer garment as opposed to paying attention to the essence and the reality of our situation. And the way we're going to be protected from that is knowing what you're doing because you have fundamentals and basics that help you to navigate yourself. All of this confusion that's going on right now is because we just don't know. It's just so simple and we're overcomplicating the issue and we're making people confused. So anyway, we wanted to take this opportunity out, inshallah ta'ala, for a few lessons just to give some basic, easy doros about a serafia. So the first thing that we want to mention is that it is known with the fitra of anyone who has a fitra salima, that if there is an individual who is a Muslim, when that person who is a Muslim makes mistakes, he's too rough, he's too tough, he drinks khamar, he's a thief, he's a liar. If there is a person who is like that, the religion of Al-Islam does not take the blame for his behavior, especially when the deen of Allah is with jealous, clear, and is showing everything that he's doing is wrong. So we can't blame a salafia for the behavior of salafis. And I think this is what happened in this case, unfortunately. Some of the rough and tough Salafi brothers, they run people away from the religion. All of us have to be aware of running people away from the religion. There was a program that came out recently called My Brother the Terrorist. I don't know if you people saw that program. The guy who made that program, he made one previously when his stepbrother became a Muslim and he was from the Muhajirun. And he was saying things like, I can't shake your hand, I shake it with the left hand, which is the land of dirt and stuff like that burning the American flag, the way we're acting, what we're saying. When our Muslims see that, they say, hey, look at these people, they're crazy. So they make people run away from the religion. In Nigeria, in Nigeria, person goes and he takes 200 girls, teenage girls, as captives. And then they do it again in another madrasa. When people in the world, when they see that, they say, who in his right mind wants to be in a religion that this is that dawah, this is their religion? So we can't be of those people who run the people away. As the Nabi used to warn his companions when he sent them out to give dawah, he used to tell them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Yassiru wa la tu'asiru, Bashiru wa la tunafiru. Make things easy, don't make things difficult, and give people glad tidings, and don't run them away from the deen. Don't make them hate the religion. Don't make them hate the masjid. Don't make them hate the sunnah. You can have the haqq. You have the flag of the haq and the call of the haq. But the place, the time, the method that you're trying to relay the haq causes people to hate you and hate what you are calling to. So we all have to look at that issue. All of us have to look at that issue. People call me to the masjid. I go to some of these masajid that are not on the sunnah. I go to that masjid and I start in the khutbah, the daras I'm going to talk about. It's going to be something sensitive that the people can't comprehend at that time. They're going to say, don't come back here again. What do you mean the Prophet's mother and his father 
they died. They're not ready to comprehend that. So leave that issue for right now and deal with what the people can appreciate, what the people can grasp. So today's class, inshallah, is a class where we just want to explain for those who know and those who don't know who are the salaf in this word. Is it something that is new? Or is it something that the scholars of Al-Islam used as far back, as far back as during the time of the tabi'een themselves? Rahimahumullahu subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's begin first by breaking it down linguistically. What is the word salaf and salafi in the Arabic language? Because from the ta'seel al-ilmi that you'll find with the ulama of al-Islam is all the time when you learn fiqh or you learn some type of science, the scholars of al-Islam before dealing with that thing, they used to always explain what it is. What is the definition? What is the linguistic definition of it? And what's the technical definition of it? so that the person can get a picture and an image of what's being dealt with. So one of the best books in the Arabic language that a person can have if he wants to know, as some of the scholars of Islam, you see a person, he cuts his lihya on his face right here. He cuts the hair off of his face. He cuts the hair off of his neck or under his chin. And when you see that, you get upset and you say, why are you cutting your lihya? He'll say to you, because you know, in the language of the Arabs, this is not considered to be my lihya at all. This is not the lihya. How you know it's not the lihya? Because linguistically, the Arabs didn't consider that to be the lihya. That's just an example of the importance of the definitions of al-Islam. Because those definitions are going to trickle down to help a person comprehend the reality of what's being dealt with. So one of the best books in the Arabic language is the book Lisan al-Arab. Lisan al-Arab. It is an umda, it is a rukan from the arkan of those books, those dictionaries in the Arabic language. The narrator of the book or the author of the book is Al Imam Ibn Manzur. Ibn Manzur. He said that the salaf, the word salaf, he said that the meaning of it is Rahimahullahu Ta'ala, Men taqaddamaka min abaika. وَذَوِي قَرَابَتِكَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فَوْقُكَ فِي السِّنْ وَالْفَضَبِ وَلِهَذَا سُمِّيَ الصَّدُرُ الْأَوَّلِ مِنَ التَّابِعِينَ السَّلَفُ الصَّالِحِ He said that the salaf in the Arabic language are those people who preceded you and they went before you from your fathers and your relatives. Those people who are above you in age and above you in virtues. And for this reason, this is why the first group of Muslims were called the Salaf al -Sadeh. So in the language of the Arabs, and I'm sure that the person who wrote those pages, I'm sure he knows something like this, because this is basic information. This is not some information that Abu Usam is bringing from the first time and is being mentioned here in this masjid. This stuff is basic and everybody knows it because it's in almost every book of someone who wrote about a Salaf here. So that's the meaning of a salaf in the language of the Arabs. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was collected by Imam Muslim. And then the Imam, and no, we explained the ahadith of Sahih Muslim, and he dealt with the issue. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to his daughter Fatima al Zahra, Innuhu ni'ma salaf ana laki. He said, hey, Fatima, I am a blessed predecessor of yours. I am your salaf. I'm older than you. I'm more virtuous than you. And I'm going to die before you. I'm going to precede you in my death. And Imam Anouwi came and he explained, what is the meaning of the word? And again, Ikhwani, this is not information that is not easily accessible. I don't even think in this audience that this audience is consistent of people who no one ever heard what I'm telling you right now. So it has a lot to do with just desires and playing games and politics, especially in today's environment, the environment of the Jannah hug. The Dawah now is about the Jannah hug. The Dawah right now is about uh, be with my group. It's about making money right now. It's about giving Dawah to the community and everyone has to be happy and we have to sing and we have to dance and we have to party. The dawah now is 
all of these issues that when the Nabi drew the Sarat al-Mustaqim, the long line, and then the subsequent line, the Dawah today is about these lines. Be with me and my group and don't be with anyone else. And if you don't agree with what I'm saying, then you're going to, and so forth and so on. So this information is not some new information. It's information that is ma'roof, mashhur, ma'loom, well known, and it's not new. Concerning the issue of the knowledge that the people of today who write like this, they know about it, is the fact that some of the ulama al kalam of the past, not to mention the ulama of the sunnah, knew what it was, a salaf al salih and a salafiya. They wrote about that. And then the ulama al kalam. From them, al Imam Abu Hamid al Ghazali, Muhammad al Ghazali. He was a big scholar in Islam, really good in usul al-fiqh, good in the Shafi'i madhab. And he wrote some really beneficial books about the, you know, the, ruh, the, the, the ruhaniyat, you know, things to make you feel good. He wrote some good books. He has that book, Ihya Ulum al-Din. In that book, there's a lot of good, and in that book, there are a lot of problems. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah used to praise aspects of the book, he used to praise aspects of the book. Al Imam al Ghazali, when he was explaining what is a Salafi, and he's from the Ulama al Kalam, he said, I mean by a Salafi, Mithab al Sahabati wa Tabi'een. A Salaf is the way of the companions and the way of the Tabi'een. He didn't say Muhammad Abdul, he didn't say Jamal al Din al Afghani, he didn't say Ibn Taymiyyah. He didn't say Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. What he understood and what everybody understood from the ulama of al-Islam, whether they're from the people of ilm al-Kalam or the Sunnah, that when someone said the Salaf, that it was the madhab of the Sahaba and the madhab of the Tabi'in. Another one of the many imams of ilm al-Kalam is al-Imam al-Bayjuri. He's not that well known. But he said, Al Murad biman salaf, man taqaddam min al anbiya'i wa sahabati wa tabi'een wa tabi'ihim. He said, The goal and the objective and the meaning of the salaf are those people who went forward before you from the prophets, and from the companions, and from the tabi'een, and from the followers of the tabi'een. So let us look now at the ulama of the Sunnah. And from one of the greatest ulama of the Sunnah is Al-Imam al-Bukhari in his book of Sahih. Al-Imam al-Bukhari in explaining and making clear what is the way of the Salaf. And when the scholar said a Salaf, what did they mean? He, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, said that this man, and listen to his name, his name is Rashid ibn Sa'd. Rashid ibn Sa'd. Al-Imam al-Bukhari brought inside al-Bukhari. That this man, Rashid ibn Sa'd, said, كان السلف يستحبون الفحولة لأنها أجرى وأجسر. Rashid ibn Sa'd, who was from the Tabi'een, he said that the Salaf used to like the Fuhula, the camel that was a warrior, the camel that was used like the male camel, the, the stud, the strong camel. He said that the Salaf, they used to raise up that camel over every other camel because that camel was quicker and that camel was stronger. So this man Rashid ibn Sa'd said that the Salaf used to like the camel. And he's from the Tabi'een. The man is from the Tabi'een. So if the man from the Tabi'een is saying that the Salaf used to like this type of camel, it's an issue of fiqh. The issue is connected to al-jihad. That's what this kalam is connected to. If you're making jihad and you're participating in the jihad and you're riding a particular kind of camel, after the Muslims win, you'll get such and such a thing from the spoils of war. If you're walking after the Muslims win, you'll get less than what he got. If you're an individual that did this and you did that, your efforts will be determined, how much you get will be determined by your efforts. So this is the kalam here. But the reason why it's being used right now 
is that a man from the Tabi'i, he said that the Salaf used to like that particular camel. And if that man was from the Tabi'i, then who could he possibly be referring to when he mentioned the word Salaf? Al Imam ibn Hajr al Asqalani, who explained all of the ahadith in Sahih Bukhari, he said about this statement of Rashid ibn Sa'd, he said the meaning, what he meant by the Salaf, ibn Hajr said, is that he means the companions. And those people who came after the companions. Because Rashid ibn Sa'd was from the Tabi'een. That's basic. It's simple. It doesn't require anybody to be tripping out or to freak out. It's, so, it's just so, it's so simple and easy. How in the world would a person with sincerity come now and say that the concept of the Salaf is something that is new? It's something that is man-made. When you have it being clearly explained to you in many, many hadith, like this one. Another example of that is what Imam al-Bukhari brought. And we could have gotten things from other places, but when the person hears that the thing is inside al-Bukhari, halas, finish, no problem. Another example of that, inside al-Bukhari, is that Imam al-Bukhari brought a statement of one of the greatest Imams from the Tabi'een, al-Imam al-Zuhri, Muhammad ibn Shihab, as Zuhri. He's from the Sigar at Tabi'in, the smaller Tabi'in. And the meaning by the smaller Tabi'in is that they took the majority of their knowledge from the Tabi'in and they took some knowledge from the companions. They met the companions. Whereas the Kibar at Tabi'in, like Al Hassan al Basri, like Ibrahim al Nakhari, they're from the major companion uh, Tabi'in. The major, the big tabi, they took the majority of their knowledge from the companions. And they took some knowledge from the other tabi. And Imam al-Zuhri is from the smaller tabi. Doesn't mean he's younger. Just means he only met about three or four companions who he actually took knowledge from. But nonetheless, he's from the tabi. And Imam al-Bukhari, he said that Imam al-Zuhri said concerning the bones. The bones of elephants the bones of camels, the bones of horses, when the bones used to bake and in the Arabian sun. And Imam Az-Zuhri said about those bones, he said, I met a number of people from the ulama, from the Salaf. They used to take those bones and they used to use it to comb their hair. They turned those bones into combs. And they used to also grind those bones up and the juice that came out, they would use it for oil for their hair, and they didn't see any problem with that. Well, what's the issue about? Why did Bukhari bring this? Bukhari brought this because there are some animals when they're dead, when they're dead, they're nedges. They're nedges. You can't touch it, you can't do anything with it. So what is the ruling about the bones of the elephant? It's the ruling of the bones of the dinosaurs. They found some bones of the dinosaurs. They're in Arabia these days. What's the ruling? Is it Najasa? Is it bad? And Imam Zuhri said, I met some ulama from the Salaf who have the opinion that they used to use those bones and turn them into combs. And they used to also grind them up. And the juice that came out, they used to use it for oil. And they didn't see any problem with that. Again, it's clear. And Imam Zuhri, he called the companions the Salaf. He called the companions the Salaf. Again, how in the world, if an individual were to hear someone screaming on the microphone with a bullhorn and he says, a salafi is Jadid, the salaf is Ibn Taymiyyah, the salaf is Muhammad Abdul Wahab, why would he get upset? Why would he get excited? Let that person scream. As for you, don't jump up and down. This thing has been dealt with in perfect detail in the Deen of Allah Azza from what we will also mention to you is what Al Imam Muslim brought. Sahih Al Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. Al Imam Muslim brought a chain of narration all the way up to the Amir al Mu'minin in Hadith, and there were 10 of them. One of the greatest of the Umara al Mu'minin in Hadith is Al Imam Abdullah ibn al Mubarak. Al Imam Muslim brought the statement in which Abdullah ibn al Mubarak. He used to stand up in front of the people during his time. He used to stand up in front of the people during his time. And he used to say, Daru hadith. 
Amr ibn Thabit, فإنه كان يسب السلف. عبد الله بن مبارك was a muhaddith. He was a scholar of al jarh wa ta'adil. He was a scholar of the sunnah. He was a scholar of fiqh. He was telling the people who wrote hadith and the people who worked by the hadith. He said, don't take the hadith. Abandon and the, avoid the hadith of a man. His name is Amr ibn Thabit. And that's because he used to curse the salaf. He used to curse the salaf. If you go and you look at the Turujama or the biography in the books of hadith, the narrators, and you find this man, Amr ibn Thabit, you're going to find that the people who he cursed were the companions because he was from the Rafida. He used to curse Abu Bakr and Umar. He used to curse Muawiyah. He used to curse Aisha radiallahu anhum ajma'in. So Abdullah bin Mubarak from the ulama of al-Hadith and other than al-Imam Abdullah ibn Mubarak, they understood and they comprehended that this concept of the Salaf. Who are the Salaf? The Salaf are the companions of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And a Salafiyah is connecting yourself to them. Simple as that. How are you going to come and say that it's something new? The awail, as sabiqun al awalun, from the ulama of this ummah, they understood. You may not understand that and you may not accept it. Your opinion doesn't mean anything. But the ulama of the past, those virtuous people, they understood that the salaf, they were the companions. They were the people who followed the companions. They were the people who followed the followers of the companions, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Al Imam al Uzai. Al Imam al Uzai was from Asham. He had his own madhab. He was an Imam of the Sunnah. He has some really beautiful statements that will give you the ta'seel al ilmi during this time. Al Imam al Uzai told us, Alaykum bi tariqat al salaf. Take the way of the salaf. And don't be faint hearted and don't be afraid from the many people who are against you. And don't get tricked by the beautiful speech that people may have. That's a ta'seel. A person, he sees himself as being on the Sunni, Salafi, but as soon as the winds of adversity come and they blow, that individual, he starts to slip. He starts to sing. He starts to change because so many people are against him. It's not, what are you worrying about? So many, he said, take the way of the Salaf and don't let the many people who are on the other way, don't let it make you afraid. And don't be faint-hearted because of the few people who are with you. Don't be like that. Don't be an individual who thinks you being on the truth is indicated only by the fact that many people are with you. You have to have the ability to say to people, hey, what you're saying is not correct. And what you're doing is not correct. It's not fair. And today's time, there are many Salafi people who are scared they are afraid to say something that the mutashaddideen don't agree with because he doesn't want to be put out there. Whether it's against those people or anybody else, don't be of the people who your religion is just trying to be with the group and trying to be okay under the radar. And Imam al-Uzai mentioned concerning this issue of a salaf He told the people, Isbir nafsaka ala sunnati. وَقِفْ حَيْثُ وَقَفَ الْقَوْمِ وَقُلْ بِمَا قَالُوا وَكُفْ أَمَّا كَفُّ عَنْهُ وَسْلَكْ سَبِيلْ سَلَفَكَ الصَّالِحِ فَإِنَّهُ يَسَعُكَ مَا وَسَعَهُ He told the people, be patient, make yourself patient, have sabr upon the sunnah and stop where the people stopped. So who are the people? We have to find out who are the people. Stop where the people stop. He said, and say what they said. And hold back from what and on what they held back from. And follow the sabil of your righteous predecessors. For verily, what was enough for them is enough for you. Now, anyone can come and interpret the people how they want to. Because this is a general statement of Imam al uzai Anyone could come and interpret the Salaf al-Salih as they want to because the kalam of al-Imam in terms of fiqh and the language, it is mujmal. It's just general. 
That's all he said. He didn't say which people. He said son of a solid. But we know when you find out the background of what happened, you know who he's talking about. Stop where the people stop. Follow the Salaf al He said this to a man who was asking excessive questions. Questions that have no benefit. For an example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that when the Dajjal comes, a Dajjal, he's going to have written on his head, Kafir, Kafir. So the descriptions of the Dajjal that he has one eye, that he's going to claim a Rububiya, he's, he's the Lord, the many descriptions that the Prophet gave about a Dajjal. There's a person who listens to those descriptions and then after hearing all of the hadith, the question that he has for the Sheikh is, you know the word kafir, is it going to be written in English or Arabic? Uh, that word kafir on his head, what if the person can't read and write? He is illiterate. Would he be able to read it? And Imam al nozai said, hey, 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 hey. Stop where the people stopped and say what they said and hold back from what they held back from. Ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh istawa. Allah is over the throne in a way that befits His Majesty. He knows the reality of that. Those people, radiallahu anhum, when those ayahs came down, although they were very inquisitive and they used to ask the Prophet everything that he did differently, any change they would ask him. They were people who wanted to know their religion. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu knocked on the door, the Nabi let him in, and his clothes were exposing his thighs, above his thighs, his knees, his thighs. The Prophet stayed in that condition. Umar came, he said, let him in, and he didn't move. Uthman came, and he sought permission, the Prophet said, hold on. He put his clothes and he covered up his thighs. He let Uthman in. The time came, all of them left. Aisha radiallahu anha, she's a talibatul ilm, she wants to know. Ya Rasulullah, Abu Bakr my father came, Umar came, and you stay like that, and then this man came, and you, you changed. Why? He said to her, Afala stahi min rajulin, yastahi minhu malaika, shall I not be shy of a man who the malaika is shy? She wanted to know. They used to have that type of desire to know. They were not people who, if they saw him smiling, they would say, what makes you smile, Ya Rasulullah? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? They were inquisitive. They wanted to know about the sunnah. But when it came to issues of aqidah, when it came to issues about the details of things, they weren't people who asked questions because the Nabi Wasallam cultivated them on that. When he told the people about the qadr, and that's an aqidah, told the people about the Qadr. Everything is by the Qadr. And he told them some stuff about the Qadr. One of the companions said, Ya Rasulullah, should we not just relax and just don't just relax and let the Qadr take over? Don't make efforts? Should we not? He wants to know if everything is written by the Qadr. Should we just not relax and let, every, let the pen overtake us? Then Nabi told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Kullun Everyone is going to find it easy to do what he been, he's been created to do. So they were people who were inquisitive. They wanted to know their link, their link, their, their deen. But they didn't go deep into that stuff. So we know that Imam Al-Uzai was talking about those companions when he says, stop where they stop, say what they said, don't go beyond what they went beyond. And he called them the Salaf al-Salih because of the background of the issue, what happened when he said it and why he said it was telling his students, don't ask questions that the Prophet's companions didn't ask, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. And Imam al-Dhahabi, he has a tremendous book called Kitab Sir Alam al-Nubala. And in that book, Sir Alam al-Nubala, talks about the great personalities in al-Islam. And al-Imam al-Dhahabi was one of the great historians in al-Islam. And in that book, he brings heroes, and he brings people who have problems as well. And one of the things that is really impressive about Al Imam al Dhahabi, especially in this book, is his fairness and his justice. His fairness and his justice. There's a man in Islam, his name is Halaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi. He was a tyrant and he was tough. And he did a lot of bad things to the companions, radiallahu anhum. But despite that fact, he was. <coughs> 
a strong personality in Islam and he helped Islam to spread and he put a cap on the spread of a lot of innovation and his personality in Islam is a personality to be reckoned with but he was a bad guy and Imam al dhahabi he would bring information about this and he would bring information about that and the historical perspective so that the one who reads it can get a picture of who the man was who the man was he was fair and just and he did that with people who were really problematic he did that with other people who were really problematic in the aqidah he would bring some of the good of what they did and he would bring some of the messed up things that they were upon no one in his right mind is going to come and claim that Al Imam al Dhahabi he fell into muwazanat. He's mentioning the good things of the people of innovation. And that's because it's clear why he's doing what he's doing. He's just trying to get people exposed to this individual's history, his seerah. He brought the seerah of one of the greatest muhaddithin in Al Islam, Al Imam al Darqutni. Al Imam al Darqutni. He brought a statement of a Darqutni. Darqutni said about himself. Darqutni said about himself. Ma shay'un abghadu ilayya min ilm al-kalam. There is nothing that I hate more than rhetoric. Ilm al-kalam. I hate this ilm al-kalam. Darqutni said that about himself. And Imam al-Dhahabi said about that statement, Lam yadkhul al-raju fi ilm al-kalam wal al-jidal. There's a student of Ibn Taymiyyah, who some people say a Salafiya started with Ibn Taymiyyah. He is one of his major students who spread a Salafiya. And Imam al Dhahabi said about the statement of al Darqutni concerning himself there's nothing that I hate more than Ilm al Kalam. Al Dhahabi said that the man, this man, he never entered into Ilm al Kalam and he never entered into Al Jidal. Argumentation argumentation al jidal he said he preoccupied himself with that and that's because he was salafi he was salafi and this man is way before the sheikh of al imam al dhahabi who some people falsely claim he was the one who invented and started a salafia a salafia jihadia is an oxymoron Political Salafia is an oxymoron. There's no such thing. Is there jihad in Islam? Yes, so there's jihad in Salafi. As for a Salafi who's takfiri, jihadi, that's an oxymoron. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Salafiya najdiya. There's Salafiya from a naj. It's an oxymoron. Well, what is that? It doesn't exist. Salafi is Salafi. It's just Islam. It's the pure Islam. It is the pure Islam. After that, Ikhwani, I want to make this point, and that is, I don't want anyone to misunderstand what we're mentioning here and what we're trying to make the point here. Today's lesson is just, if we want to know who the Salaf are, then it's not something that is ambiguous. It's something that's easy, something that there's ittifaq between the scholars, what it is. Only people who have ulterior motives or people who are mixed up, they don't know, they make these false claims that are not supported by knowledge that a Salafi is something new. A Salafi is something that was invented and created by a group of people or one person. Something that is not true. Something that is not true. But you should understand everything that existed during the time of the companions and everything that existed during the time of the Tabi'een and the followers of the Tabi'een, we don't call that Salafi. Because they were things that existed during the time of the companions that is innovation. Many of those groups that are against the way of the Salaf, like the Khawarij, they were doing the time of the companion. Their heads came up. Like the Rafida, their heads came up. The Shiite, who started to curse the companions. That happened during the time of the companions of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Qadariya, the people who started to say, Nothing is by the Qadr. Allah doesn't know what's going to happen until it happens. That happened during the time of the companions, radiallahu anhum. So in terms of the zaman, in terms of the time, the salaf, they are the companions and the tabi'un and the followers of the tabi'een. 
but it is the good things that were going on during that time. And that's why the scholars call it as Salaf al Salih, the righteous predecessors. Not the stuff that was happening that wasn't of a religious nature. So everything that was present during their time, you don't consider that to be from a Salafia because there were some things that Al Islam were opposed to. Last thing that we want to mention right now is in trying to identify and talk about who the Salaf are and what is meant by that, again, I repeat and I reiterate the goal and the objective, Ikhwani, is not hanging on to these titles. A man can scream all day that he is Salafi all day. He can do that all day. And that's not what Allah, his messenger, wants from us. Allah doesn't want us to run around screaming Salafi, Salafi, but everything that we're doing is contrary to a Salafiyah. Today's talk is academic. Who are the Salaf? That's the Salaf. But the goal and the objective and the Turkeys and the emphasis is upon making jihad and struggling, trying to implement the way, the minhaj, the methodology of the Salaf. al-ilmi, the one who has a foundation, he realizes there's a big distinction and difference between I know what Salafi is, and I have to make a struggle to be Salafi. It seems like the emphasis now is on the word. And there's his bia with the Salafi. I'm on the right team. My team is better than your team. And I'm Salafi. And that's not the goal and the objective. The goal and the objective is for the person to try to be on the way of those companions. By preoccupying himself with having the correct aqidah. Preoccupying himself with having the correct minhaj about how he's going along and he's dealing with issues in his life. By being a person who is studying his religion. By being an individual who is protecting his lisan. By being an individual who is doing those afkar of the daytime and the nighttime. As for being preoccupied with being judgmental towards people and we're some of the worst people in our behavior. And we actually think, well... As long as I'm Salafi, it's okay because those people, uh, they off of it. And I'm not off of it, so I'm better than it. Ooh, that's backwards. That's mixed up. That's not the goal and the objective. That's not the goal and the objective. A Salafi is the haq. It is al-Islam al-Musaffa. It's the pure Islam. But again, what's in, uh, what's in the name? What's in the name? A person who says he's a Muslim. He's a Muslim, but he doesn't make his Islam to Allah with a tawheed. He is a Muslim and he claims that he submits, but he's making shirk all the time in what he believes in. He's misbehaved in the, what's the benefit of screaming, I'm a Muslim and you're a kafir, I'm a Muslim and you're a kafir. What's the benefit? It's the, that's not the goal, that's not the objective. So as it relates to who the Salaf are, this is, and that was, who they are. And it is not a term that, that is new with the people, it's something that the scholars from a long time, they knew and they understood. So for the next five, six, seven minutes until 8.30, inshallah, if you brothers have any questions concerning this, you can put your questions forward. And I would hope and I would love that people would bring with sincerity, you know, the issues that are in your head and in your mind. Let's not be of those people who, you know, we hide things on the inside. We don't be afraid. Just say what you have to say, inshallah. We deal with the issue to the best of our ability collectively. For the Akhi Karim. Yeah, your salat could be accepted if your condition dictated that you prayed amongst people who were Sufi. So a general question like that, you're not responsible for uh, who's praying next to you. That's not your job. That's not your objective. We're getting ready to pray behind a man right now, Salat al-Maghrib, inshallah. And we don't know who from amongst us are even real Muslims. So that's not anyone's business. We're going to pray behind this man. It's not our business who's next to you, who's in front of you, who's behind you. <coughs> If that imam who's going to pray with us is a Sufi, he is a Sufi, and he's on Sufism that doesn't take him outside of the religion of Al-Islam, then we can pray behind him as well. We can pray behind him as well. But if that imam is praying and the Sufism that he believes in is the Sufism of Al-Kufr and Shirk, 
like the Baha'iyya, those people, what they believe, the Qadiyaniyya, they pray. If you pray behind those people and you know that that man is Qadiyani, then you didn't pray at all. You didn't pray at all. You didn't pray at all because what they believe in takes them outside of the fold of Al-Islam. And Allah is A'la in A'la. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Tfadda ya akhi, tfadda. I don't want to talk too much about Boko Haram. That's because I have family members in Nigeria. And if you disagree with Boko Haram and Shabab and people like this, they will kill you and they will kill your family. They will kill you and they will kill your family. There was a time when you can say something about them here in the UK. And nothing's going to happen to you. Nothing will happen to you because you're in the UK. But they'll go and kill your family. They will kill your family. So it's not wise for me to talk about Boko Haram with my family members there in Nigeria. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Okay. Tfadda, ya akhi. Tfadda. Tfadda, ya akhi. Uh, that's not true that uh, the Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen did not like the term a Salafi because of what we just proved to you that a Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen would not be against what the ulama of the Salaf, the ulama of al Islam, who he comprehended what they said so well, he wouldn't be against what they said. What the Sheikh did not like was for the division of the ummah that we have today in the form of the many groups like the Ikhwan Muslimin, like Jamaat al-Jihad, like the Muhajirun, like the different Sufi groups, like a group of people who call themselves Salafi in their group. <coughs> so they're a group of people who are Salafi and they're a group. If you disagree with us, something's wrong with you and there's a group of Hizbiya. He said, this is not permissible because a Salafiyya is not a group like that. A group where someone's in charge, there's an imam, there's a secretary, there's a leader. Everyone has to agree with what you're saying. No, that's what he was against. He was against the Hizbiyya that some Salafi people made on a Salafiyya. As for Salafiyya, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen said, in many places that a Salafiyya is al Islam and it is the Haq. This person wants to know, do you have to call yourself Salafi? La wallahi, you don't have to call yourself Salafi. But Shaykh al-Islam ibn Utaymiyyah, he mentioned, and I was going to read this, but I didn't for time. He said in his book, Majmul al-Fatawa, وَلَا عِيبَ عَلَى مَنْ أَظْهَرَ مَذْهَبَ السَّلَفِ وَانْتَسَبَ إِلَيْهِ وَاعْتَزَّ بِهِ إِلَيْهِ بل يجب قبول ذلك منه باتفاق فإن مذهب السلف لا يكون إلا حقا. He said there is no blame and no problem with an individual to show that he is upon and he supports the way of the salaf and he connects himself to the way of the salaf and he finds honor in connecting himself to the way of the salaf. As a matter of fact, it is wajib for that to be accepted from him if he does that with ittifaq and the unanimous, unanimous agreement of the scholars. For verily the way of the Salaf, it is the truth. But if you don't have to use the word, then you don't have to use the word. If there's going to be a problem with using the word, you don't have to use the word. But a person shouldn't be ashamed or embarrassed. But if he doesn't use it for some dawa reason, real dawa reason, no problem, no problem. Person said, what is a Salafi? A Salafi is simply the person who's trying to follow the way of the righteous predecessor. He understands that. He's trying his best. Doesn't mean he's an angel. Doesn't mean he doesn't ever make mistakes. He can make mistakes. But from the way of the Salaf is to make toba from the mistakes that the person makes. Lastly, and this is the last question, how do you know that you are Salafi or on the minhaj of a Salafiyya? You know that with knowledge. 
if an individual, like this thing about Ahlul Hadith, uh, Ahlul Sunnah, many of the people who are claiming Ahlul Sunnah, the Deobandis, they claim Ahlul Sunnah. They're from the Ashara, they say that they're Ahlul Sunnah, but they won't say that they're Salafi. So a person may think he's from Ahlul Sunnah, but he doesn't know what Ahlul Sunnah is, and he really believes he's from Ahlul Sunnah, that's possible. So it's with knowledge. So if a person knows the way of the Salaf, and his niya is in trying to practice that to the best of his ability with knowledge, then inshallah ta'ala he is salafi, even if his opponents say he's not salafi, even if his opponents say that he's not salafi. So don't be of those people who are afraid of the rules and the hukums that people are given. We're going to stop here inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask Allah ta'ala to give us the thabat on his kitab and the sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to give us ikhlas in our statements and our actions subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa shadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk